presentation of the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Special funding for this program is provided by the Hartford through the Hartford Insurance Group Foundation and the Connecticut Humanities Council. in motion and not in motion. Oh, that this lashing wind were something more than the spirit of Ludwig Richter. The rain is pouring down. It is July. There is lightning and the thickest thunder. It is a spectacle. Scene 10 becomes 11 in series X, Act 4, etc., People fall out of windows, trees tumble down. Summer is changed to winter, the young grow old. The air is full of children, statues, roofs, and snow. The theater is spinning round, colliding with deaf-mute churches and optical trains. The most massive sopranos are singing songs of scales, and Ludwig Richter Turbulent Schlemiel has lost the hole in which he was contained. Knows desire without an object of desire. All mind and violence and nothing felt. He knows he has nothing more to think about. Like the wind that lashes everything at once. Wallace Stevens died in Hartford, Connecticut in 1955. For the last 39 years of his life, the poet worked as a lawyer in the surety bond claim department of the Hartford Insurance Group. In 1934, he was promoted to vice president. Stevens lived here with his wife, Elsie, and their daughter, Holly. From this house, he walked two miles to work. He often composed poetry while walking and believed that his own movement helped form the rhythm of the poem. For Stevens, this northern landscape formed one pole of his experience and more importantly of his imagination. The opposite world was Florida, especially Key West. Each winter he absorbed its tropical atmosphere on fishing trips he took with his male friends. Stevens is America's great poet of the endless cycles of desire and despair. He writes of the mind's hunger for imaginative possibilities and of reality's stubborn resistance. Today, there are only a few surviving neighbors and business associates who knew him. Those who knew him saw in his disciplined public life only hints of his spiritual and emotional struggles. Stevens' inner life is revealed in his poetry. Well, if you leave out his personal life, he was a happy man. I used to see Wallace Stevens walking down the street, going to work. He, li he was a neighbor, and he used to walk to work every morning. And as I saw him pass my house every morning, I used to be so thrilled. 
And then in the afternoon at 4 o'clock, he'd be coming back. And at 4 o'clock, I'd be outdoors here with the children in the neighborhood uh, playing games. And when I saw Wallace Stevens walk by this house, I would make the children stop and look at him. And I would say to them, you look at this man. He's a great poet, and don't you ever forget him. I would say he was respected by our department, perhaps a little bit feared, uh, more in an awesome manner than anything else. But we got along well with him. I try to draw a definite line between poetry and business. And I'm sure that most people here in Hartford know nothing about the poetry. And I'm equally sure that I don't want them to know. Because once they know, they don't seem to get over it. I mean that once they know, they never think of you as anything but a poet. And after all, one is inevitably much more complicated than that. I find it hard to give you any specific information as to uh, what he would say during the course of our conversations. But I do recall one time when I got to know him a little better. He called me in the office one day, and he says to me, Bernie, he said, uh, can you give me uh, your idea of what imagination was? I said, no, I don't have any idea. He said, well, why don't you think about it a couple of days and come back, and we'll talk about it. But he never brought the subject up again. <laughs> Very thankful, too. O oh, Florida, venereal soil. A few things for themselves, convolvulus and coral, buzzards and live moss, tiestas from the keys. A few things for themselves, Florida, venereal soil, disclosed to the lover. The dreadful sundry of this world, the Cuban, Polodovsky, Mexican women, the Negro undertaker killing the time between corpses, fishing for crayfish, virgin of boorish births. Swiftly in the nights, in the porches of Key West, behind the bougainvilleas, after the guitar is asleep, lasciviously as the wind you come tormenting, insatiable. When you might sit, a scholar of darkness sequestered over the sea, wearing a clear tiara of red and blue and red, sparkling, solitary, still in the high sea shadow. Donna, donna, dark, stooping in indigo gown and cloudy constellations, conceal yourself or disclose fewest things to the lover a hand that bears a thick-leaved fruit, a pungent bloom against your shade. There's something intensely secretive about Stevens. Um, one doesn't know. I, I don't, it's hard, the, the disclosures in Stevens are not the, of the most, um, uh, not of, of the primary sort. He never says, I am feeling bad today. It's not that way at all. Stevens is a poet of the most profound subjectivity. He refuses to give any personal details about himself. He refuses to give you a voluntary self-revelation of any kind. He deals with the appearances of things, the apparent appearances of things, as they play over him and as he plays over them. He deals with nuances. He is, as he says, a poet of the weather, which he understood always as meaning what it means for all of us, the presence or absence of sun and the movement of the wind, which are very clearly uh, 
universal human tropes or metaphors for states of the spirit or conditions of the soul. He's very interested in, in polar things. He's, he's always stressing that, that opposites depend on one another, night and day, sun and moon, man and woman. And I think, I think uh, the, the extremes of weather uh, stand for him, as, as, as weather does in general, uh, as, as the extreme oscillations of, of a mood, of, of a temperament. And each landscape has has uh, you know its its own its own flora its own palette uh, that there there are infinite ways of, of of dramatizing this this temperament you you have, you have your objective correlatives uh, spread out before you once once you call on the on the imagery of, of cold or or of or of the tropics the snowman. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow, and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place for the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. Well, for Stevens, the imagination was the great transformer of the world that enabled his poems. And in that respect, the imagination for him wasn't any different from what it is for other poets. Uh, a great deal of emphasis is put on it because it's an enabling force. And it's extremely powerful. Since without an imagination or the imagination, he would have no poems. The imagination is, is, is a superb instrument, but it's also subversive. Perhaps uh, ju just, I mean, if, if there is if there is no God, then there is no devil. But still, these negative and positive forces are, are at work, particularly in the human in the human mind and in the human language. You know, language language works against itself uh, as as much as much as for. believed that the American landscape was one of the great resources for the American poet. He traveled more than most Eastern poets did, partly because of his work in the early years of the insurance company as a surety insurance man. He had to go and check out the various claims that were made, so that he traveled in Florida, he traveled in Tennessee, he traveled in Alabama, and saw the American landscape as a constantly changing and beautifully varied place. And how to get all of North America down in verse when your models are all English, is one of his continuing projects. He wrote about the obligation of poetry to respect and reflect its landscape as early as the comedian as the letter C, his long autobiographical early poems, where he says that the man in Georgia waking among pines should be pine spokesman. The responsive man planting his pristine cores in Florida should prick thereof not on the psaltery, but on the banjo's categorical gut, so that each landscape had its own appropriate instrument and its own appropriate poetry. The house where Wallace Stevens was born in 1879 still stands at 323 North 5th Street, Reading, Pennsylvania. Today it bears a plaque stating the unadorned facts of Stephen's life. Birthplace of the internationally acclaimed poet. He attended Reading's High School for Boys, Harvard College, and New York Law School, 
and combined successful careers as an insurance company executive and award-winning poet. In 1955, the collected poems of Wallace Stevens won both the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and the National Book Award. This is a life's work, but it's not an autobiography. It would be very difficult on the basis of reading the collected poems to extrapolate a, uh, a life. And it's not uh, an internal record in any conventional way. It's a book of a lot of things that Stevens made up. But it is uh, the book that will represent him for hereafter. I mean, it is his world. It is the world in which he lived. Reading was important to Stevens for, I think, two primary reasons. One, in it, he belonged to a family that had importance, and it was a provincial American city that was undergoing the changes of urbanization and the, the late Industrial Revolution in America and put him in touch exactly with what was going on in his time. And two, Reading was and is a place where you can walk out of the city within minutes and be in open countryside and farmland, which for Stevens was the most important source of his imagination. What is the poet's subject? It is his sense of the world. The truth is that a man's sense of the world dictates his subjects to him, and that this sense is derived from his personality, his temperament, over which he has little control and possibly none except superficially. It is not a literary problem. It is the problem of his mind and nerves. These sayings are another form of the saying that poets are born, not made. A poet writes of twilight because he shrinks from noonday. It is an illusion that we were ever alive, lived in the houses of mothers, arranged ourselves by our own motions in a freedom of air. Regard the freedom of 70 years ago. It is no longer air. The houses still stand, though they are rigid, in rigid emptiness. Even our shadows, their shadows, no longer remain. When I was younger, I always used to think that I got my practical side from my father and my imagination from my mother. She would play hymns on Sunday evening and sing. I remember her studious touch at the piano, out of practice, and her absorbed, detached way of singing. I remember how she always read a chapter from the Bible every night to all of us when we were ready for bed. Often, one or two of us fell asleep. She always maintained an active interest in the Bible and found there the solace she desired. She was, of course, disappointed, as we all are. Well, the disillusionments of youth to age take place differently for different people. It does seem, as one reads Stephen's poems, that the first imaginative vacancy was caused by the lack of that religious upbringing that he had had in his youth with all the attendant literature. All of English literature is based on the King James Bible and the aura of theological imagination that surrounds that. Stevens came to Harvard at a moment when the most important ideas being dealt with were Nietzsche's proclamation after Darwin that God was dead. And as Stevens put it late in his life, the problem was, in William James's phrase, what to do with the will to believe once there wasn't a God in whom to believe. When Stevens came to Harvard, he had already published poems in his school journal in high school, so that we know he was already thinking of being a poet before he came here to Harvard. He was taken up by George Santayana, who was teaching philosophy here. They exchanged sonnets. One of the earliest poems of Stevens was the poem he gave to Santayana, saying that nature and religion were in conflict. The poem begins, cathedrals are not built beside the sea. And his argument to the poem is that the sea would distract everyone in the cathedral from their prayers. Santayana gave him back a sonnet in exchange, thereby, so to speak, commending Stephen's own poetry. I am conscious that when I leave Cambridge, I shall leave all the surroundings that I've ever lived in. I'm going to New York, I think, to try my hand at journalism. When Stevens tried his hand at journalism in New York, following his father's advice, 
Though he succeeded financially, uh, he was doing very well in filling space and getting paid for it. What he couldn't handle was the brutal reality that New York presented him. Some of the stories he was sent out to cover simply, as other experiences in his life, bathed him in tears too often. He wasn't Stephen Crane-like. He couldn't look at the harsher facts of New York and just report on them with cool objectivity. All New York, as I have seen it, is for sale. And I think the parts I have seen are the parts that make New York what it is. It is dominated by necessity. Everything has its price, from vice to virtue. Eventually, Stevens left journalism, followed his father's advice, went to law school, passed the bar. After a few failed attempts in various law offices and in setting up his own practice with a partner, he got himself a job in an insurance company. I'm in the black hole again, without knowing any of my neighbors. The very animal in me cries out for a lair. I want to see somebody, hear somebody speak to me, look at somebody, speak to somebody in turn. I want companions. I want more than my work, than the nods of acquaintances in this little room. I do not want my dreams, my castles, my hunts, my nuit blanche, my great companies of good friends. Yet I dare not say what I do want. It is such a simple thing. When Stevens went back to Reading after finishing law school and found this very beautiful young creature, Elsie Maul, it was very much seeing in her something of the country girl that represented Reading's countryside. It was also that Elsie was unshaped, both physically very beautiful, she had an untrained imagination and an untrained intellect. She'd only finished. Uh, first year of secondary school. Stevens could shape her, Pygmalion-like, into what he needed her to be. And he began then, again, writing poems himself as June books to her for her birthdays. He would compose 20 or 25 poems and make them into a little book and present them to her each year on her birthday. 20 years later, many of these poems found themselves into his first volume, Harmonium. Peter Quince at the clavier. Just as my fingers on these keys make music, so the self-same sounds on my spirit make the music too. Music is feeling then, not sound. And thus it is that what I feel here in this room desiring you Thinking of your blue shadowed silk is music. It is like the strain waked in the elders by Susanna. Of a green evening, clear and warm, she bathed in her still garden while the red eyed elders watching felt the bases of their being throb in witching chords and their thin blood pizzicati of Hosanna. After their marriage, Stevens brought Elsie with him to New York and installed her in their Chelsea apartment. And she was coming from Reading in a life there like a fish out of water, whereas he had a very rich life here already, moving with an artistic group of people and in his business life as a lawyer and being therefore occupied most of the time. She was alone in an apartment without to her, her inner resources were not great enough to sustain her through the changes. And he was not that attentive to how painful those changes were for her. So that in spite of the great love that he had for her uh, and that he expressed to her through their courtship, the reality of their marriage and their everyday life was very painful. The second disillusion for him was the lack of faith in romantic attachment. He had made a very deep and prolonged romantic, uh, romantic attachment that turned into marriage. And then the marriage, as far as we can see, became cold or chilled, as perhaps most marriages do, 
But for him, that was a sense of a deep mistake-making capacity in himself, that one's choices can be as variable, too, as the weather. After the move to Hartford, things really did not improve in the marriage. In his house in Hartford, surrounded by beautiful objects with his books, his periodicals, eventually, for Stevens, as he makes very clear in Men Made Out of Words, it's propositions about life that replace life. Men Made Out of Words. What should we be without the sexual myth, the human reverie or poem of death? Castratos of moon mash. Life consists of propositions about life. The human reverie is a solitude in which we compose these propositions, torn by dreams, by the terrible incantations of defeat, and by the fear that defeats and dreams are one. The whole race is a poet that writes down the eccentric propositions of its fate. Well, I do believe that, that, uh, that poetry could be, could be defined as a virtual life of, of the emotion. Uh, and probably, if, if your own domestic arrangements, I don't know that much about the Stevens household, but it seems as if a kind of standstill had been, had been arrived at uh, between him and his wife, at any rate, and that he was still you know, a very passionate man, uh, at least imaginatively passionate, and, and that the energy that would, would have gone into, into love letters uh, or, or, or the, the interchange of, an early, of, an early, of the early years of a marriage was, was finally deflected, probably rather quickly deflected, in, into the imaginative energy of his poems. Stephen's poetic project, uh, I suppose it was to bring a, his readers into a consciousness of the, of their part in, in divinity, of a kind of divinity stripped of theological trappings, but to, to understand that the way they saw things, the way they received the world, the way they, the way, in short, their imaginations operated was um, of, of ultimate interest and, and, and could attain to, to, uh, to all kinds of splendor and, and refinement. Sunday Morning is really the first poem, I think, to begin from the premise, the god of an old mythology is dead, where do we go from there? I take it that Sunday Morning is about the satisfactions of life in a world without any great coordinating mythology, the spontaneity and freedom that that position affords. It's given is that the poet in the persona of the woman who is the protagonist stays at home on Sunday instead of going to church. She's convinced that Christianity is dead. She hears a voice coming across history to her saying, the tomb in Palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering. It is the grave of Jesus where he lay. And by restoring Christ to his role as a man, the Jesus who lived and died, it restores the reader and one would suspect the woman of the poem as well to all the satisfactions of the physical earth. And Stevens considers in the poem many sources of happiness, 
sources of nature, sources of eros, sources of moods and pleasures, and ends in a sadder way, saying that we live in isolation, but we also live in spontaneity. If we don't have a providential God directing our lives, neither do we have a judging God deciding on our lives. Instead, we live in island solitude, unsponsored, free. Complacencies of the peignoir, and late coffee and oranges in a sunny chair, and the green freedom of a cockatoo upon a rug mingled to dissipate the holy hush of ancient sacrifice. She dreams a little, and she feels the dark encroachment of that old catastrophe as a calm darkens among water lights. The pungent oranges and bright green wings seem things in some procession of the dead, winding across wide water without sound. The day is like wide water without sound, stilled for the passing of her dreaming feet over the seas, to silent Palestine, dominion of the blood and sepulcher. She hears upon that water without sound a voice that cries, the tomb in Palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering, it is the grave of Jesus where he lay. We live in an old chaos of the sun or old dependency of day and night or island solitude, unsponsored, free of that wide water, inescapable. Deer walk upon our mountains, and the quail whistle about us their spontaneous cries. Sweet berries ripen in the wilderness, and in the isolation of the sky at evening, casual flocks of pigeons make ambiguous undulations as they sink downward to darkness on extended wings. One of the projects of Stephen's poetry might be thought of as the search for a Native American sublime. Not a sublime imported from Europe and from European literature, but one based upon the local materials of the American landscape. In this way, he's very much like his friend, and in their early days, almost collaborator, William Carlos Williams. But with this difference, that Williams always wished to provide in his poetry the gritty details of American life, often untransformed, or at least transformed only by their context. Whereas more and more, as Stevens grew older, he resembled the romantic poets in wishing to reform in his imagination and present again the local American scene. I think that Stevens was the first American poet uh, to present himself as an artist. Uh, Frost created a persona of a savvy Yankee who happened to have a way with words. Uh, Eliot showed himself as a a pious Christian, a student of culture, uh, found perhaps a student of history and economics and a lover of, of the Provencal tradition. But Stevens, again and again, uh, you feel that his primary concern is art. He had an intense interest in the visual arts, he followed the movements in American painting from the Armory Show of 1913 to abstract expressionism in the 1940s. And many of Stevens's poems, I think, can be fruitfully compared with paintings. Some of them, in fact, are based upon actual paintings. Stevens saw in the paintings of both Paul Klee, who was his favorite painter, and Cezanne, the kind of work he wanted himself to do as a modernist poet. Klee had imagined symbols. Klee is not a directly realistic painter, and is full of whimsical and fanciful and imaginative and humorous projections of reality in his paintings. The paintings are often enigmatic or full of riddles, and Stevens liked that as well. What Stevens liked in Cezanne was the reduction, you might say, of the world to a few monumental objects, the apples next to the skulls, the single mountain, 
approached again and again, seen from close up, seen from far away. And that sense of the monumental air that simple things take on when they become the focus of attention in Cezanne appealed to Stevens as well. The paramount relation between poetry and painting today, between modern man and modern art, is simply this, that in an age in which disbelief is so profoundly prevalent, or if not disbelief, indifference to questions of belief, poetry and painting and the arts in general are, in their measure, a compensation for what has been lost. At the southernmost point of the Florida Keys lies Key West, the only truly tropical city in the United States. When unemployment ran high due to the decline of the handmade cigar industry, Key West and its citizens showed great resourcefulness. A plan was conceived to modernize the city into a tropical winter resort. Today, Key West is a beehive of activity. Old native houses such as these are being transformed by modernization and repair into charming cottages, such as this. Handsome homes whose cupolas were trod by ship owners of clipper days take on new beauty under the paintbrushes of local workers. New buildings and stores spring up throughout the city. Men are working, industry is coming to life. Business is awakening through this major modernization activity which will give American tourists a tropical resort within the confines of their own land. The idea of order at Key West is in many ways a typical Stevens title. It balances out a grand claim toward abstraction or generality, the idea of, and a particular place, Key West, a place, of course, that Stevens knew from his annual visits. It's as if all of our grand thoughts can only be validated in terms of one time and one particular place. And in the poem, you have the classic situation of the poet addressing physical nature, singing girl walking by the sea, trying to understand the relationship between words and physical reality. She sang beyond the genius of the sea. The water never formed to mind or voice. Like a body, holy body, fluttering its empty sleeves. And yet, its mimic motion made constant cry, caused constantly a cry that was not ours. Although we understood, inhuman, of the veritable ocean. Stevens takes the uttermost point of the American landscape, the moment where the American soil meets the sea, in that shore where the human mind is poised, listening to the non-articulated voice of the sea that has not yet formed to mind a voice and trying to put mind together with nature. And that shore that the singer walks on is the shore that every poet walks on, listening to the sounds of the world and trying to articulate them into language. The sea was not a mask, no more was she. The sun and water were not medleyed sound, even if what she sang was what she heard since what she sang was uttered word by word. It may be that in all her phrases stirred the grinding water and the gasping wind, but it was she and not the sea we heard. The young woman singing by the sea is the type of the poet. She's actually referred to later in the poem as the maker the classic name for the poet. And as she tries to harmonize the sounds of the sea, she rehearses, in effect, different theories of the relationship between the poet 
from physical reality. She was the single artificer of the world in which she sang. And when she sang, the sea, whatever self it had, became the self that was her song. For she was the maker. Then we, as we beheld her striding there alone, knew that there never was a world for her except the one she sang. And singing made Ramon Fernandez, tell me, if you know, why, when the singing ended and we turned toward the town, tell why the glassy lights, lights in the fishing boats at anchor there, as the night descended, tilting in the air, mastered the night and portioned out the sea fixing emblazoned zones and fiery poles, arranging, deepening, enchanting night. Stevens is talking about the way the poet charts the world for us, just the way geographers chart the world by making up those imaginary lines like the equator and the longitude and latitude lines and poles and zones like the temperate zone and the tropic zone. None of those are real. You can't see those lines. You can't see the North Pole when you go there. There's nothing to see. But nonetheless, it's by latitude and longitude lines that we know and can give a position to where we are in the world. And it's that that the poet does, too, so that after you've heard the song of the girl and you're walking back home, suddenly the whole night seems to be charted as by new lines of latitude and longitude. He turns from musing by himself to addressing another human being, saying, Ramon Fernandez, tell me if you know why when the singing ended and we turned toward the town, tell why the glassy lights, the lights in the fishing boats at anchor there as the night descended, tilting in the air, mastered the night and portioned out the sea, fixing emblazoned zones and fiery poles, arranging, deepening, enchanting night. And to fix emblazoned zones and fiery poles so that the world becomes intelligible instead of being simply the random mass of sensation that our senses receive is what poetry as well as philosophy as well as all organization of nature into culture does, says Stevens. Oh, blessed rage for order, pale Ramon. The maker's rage to order words of the sea. Words of the fragrant portals, dimly starred, and of ourselves and of our origins, in ghostlier demarcations, keener sounds. How do you deal with his obscurity? Uh... Well, in the same way that you, that you might deal with Mallarmé's obscurity. I can't make head or tail of Mallarmé, and yet, yet he's someone I'll continue to read until I die. And it, it's a matter of the, for one thing, the, the, the great beauty of the wording. And, and uh, also the, these, these, uh, these enticements, the equivalent of stained glass and incense, if you like, the roles they play in, in the in the bitter message from the pulpit. Not that his message is bitter, but it is rather lonely. Difficult things are difficult sometimes to talk about. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to be uh, absolutely clear and concise about matters that are very ornate and highly nuanced. We've developed in the United States a dependency on journalese. And so our tolerance for complex sentences, elaborate diction is, uh, is minimal. So sure, someone reading Stevens for the first time who has been 
reading novels, newspapers, is going to be thrown, is going to find himself in no man's land, and find himself in a very abstract space indeed. Why shouldn't he? What's wrong with that? I mean, after all, Stephen's poetic space is a projected space. It's an imagined world. It's the place he's made of his experience. I mean, no poet is a recorder of experience in which he hopes for a one-to-one -one relationship. It's the reason why he thought imagination was so crucial, because it is what thinks up culture. Everyone is engaged in it, philosophers, poets, painters, the ordinary man, a woman who creates a house, is thinking up a part of culture. We do it every day. Everyone does it every day in making up the things they love, the people they love, the things they value, the politics they create. And he then decided that reality was as it was imagined. Things seen, he said, are things as seen. And he also said that the imagination was the one reality in this imagined world. to an idea. A cabin stands deserted on a beach. It is white, as by a custom, or according to an ancestral theme, or as a consequence of an infinite course. Flowers against the wall are white, a little dried, kind of mark reminding, trying to remind, of a white, it was different, something else, last year or before. Not the white of an aging afternoon, whether fresher or duller, whether of winter cloud or of winter sky, from horizon to horizon. The wind is blowing the sand across the floor. Here, being visible is being white, is being of the solid of white, the accomplishment of an extremist in an exercise. The season changes. Cold wind chills the beach. The long lines of it grow longer, emptier. The darkness gathers, though it does not fall. And the whiteness grows less vivid on the wall. The man who is walking turns blankly on the sand. He observes how the north is always enlarging the chain with its frigid brilliances. Its blue-red sweeps and gusts of great enkindlings. Its polar green, the color of ice, and fire, and solitude. He enters as himself. I believe it is his only major poem in which he allows himself to enter in his proper person as a kind of dramatic figure. A great beach scene in the early cantos or sections of the auroras of autumn. He stares at the extraordinary display of the northern lights, the vitality, the color, the power of the aurora borealis is a terrible reproach to his own waning vitality, not just as an imagination, but as a potent male or aging human being, or to his own terrible sense of indeed turning blankly on the sand, of being a visible or audible blank, nothing more and nothing less. And he gathers himself together. He tries to make the supreme effort of his poetry to reduce what he confronts to what he calls a first idea or new point of origin, and then to reimagine that idea and take the reduction and the reimagination together and say, look, this is my poem. 
this is my act of creation. So he cries out about the auroras, these glorious northern lights. He cries out, this is nothing, and the this is means the northern lights. This is nothing until in a single man contained. Nothing until this named thing, the auroras, nameless is and is destroyed. And suddenly he becomes wholly self-referential and he says of himself, he opens the door of his house on flames. That is to say, you've made your supreme effort, you fling open the door of your spirit, of your whole being, of everything you've taught yourself to write and be. You fling it open and at just that moment, the northern lights say, all right, if you wish to defy us, now you get our full flare. And flames suddenly light up. The whole sky is absolutely aflame. The scholar of one candle sees an arctic effulgence flare upon the frame of everything he is, and he feels afraid. That is to say, you make the supreme effort of your own imagination, and all the intensity and power and discipline genius of your imagination only makes you more fearful rather than less fearful. This is called Final Soliloquy of the Interior Paramour. Light the first light of evening, as in a room in which we rest and for small reason think the world imagined is the ultimate good. This is therefore the intensest rendezvous. It is in that thought that we collect ourselves out of all the indifferences into one thing. Within a single thing, a single shawl wrapped tightly round us since we are poor, a warmth, a light, a power, a miraculous influence. Here now we forget each other and ourselves. We feel the obscurity of an order, a whole, a knowledge, that which arranged the rendezvous within its vital boundary in the mind. We say, God and the imagination are one. How high that highest candle lights the dark. Out of this same light, out of the central mind, we make a dwelling in the evening air in which being there together is enough. <laughs> Sometimes I feel about this poem the way other people feel about the 23rd Psalm. I think it's, <laughs> it's so beautiful and it's so, it's so comforting. In, in, uh, in, its, in its essential withdrawing of comfort, uh, perhaps. But again, it's, 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 uh, the, it, what it stresses is, is, the, is the transcendence uh, within ourselves that we're all, that we're all responsible for, for the, for, the, uh, for the keeping of our imaginations uh, new and tender. I don't know what I would call the last phase, but a kind of realist, I think, much more in touch with uh, the, um, the fact of his age and the fact of the choices he's made. And much more, I mean, he resigned at the end that he, the book, the planet on the table is what he has made of his life or what he has made of the world that he has given his life over to art. And it's one of the sad features of the book. I mean, it's rueful a little. He wonders, have I lived? Uh, was it worth it? I think at the end of everyone's life, they take a look back and wonder, did I make the right choice? Uh, have I, in being a man, have I been a man of bone only, not a man of flesh that is a living man?
was glad he had written his poems. They were of a remembered time or of something seen that he liked. Other makings of the sun were waste and welter, and the ripe shrub writhed. His self and the sun were one, and his poems, although makings of his self, were no less makings of the sun. It was not important that they survived. What mattered was that they should bear some lineament or character, some affluence, if only half perceived, in the poverty of their words, of the planet of which they were part. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Special funding for this program is provided by the Hartford through the Hartford Insurance Group Foundation and the Connecticut Humanities Council. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.